Manly. What's up, bud? What's happening? I'm, I'm having a good time already. Good. I just got I'm here. Glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. This is about having a good time and also educating uh, our public viewers, our Beautiful. audience Beautiful. on Beautiful. who you are and what you've done. So good morning and welcome to the Manny Gomez Show. Today is heavyweight boxing great Jerry Cooney, also known as <gasps> Gentleman Jerry. <gasps> The legend himself, ladies and gentlemen. So, Jerry, thank you for joining us. Today is truly an honor for me personally, and I'm sure for our public audience. M Manny, I always love to be with you, and uh, we see each other a lot of times. I've been really doing a lot of stuff with the police department. I love those guys, always have, always will, and I always love to see you. So, um, I'm glad to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank you once again for joining us. Uh, so, let, let's start off by talking about your book. Uh, Gentleman oh. Jerry. Oh, there you go. It's my book. There you go. Gentleman Jerry. Highly encourage it. Great read. And uh, a lot of you good folks know a lot about Jerry from his boxing days, but the book is also very instrumental in talking about the other side of Jerry that you may or may not know about. So highly recommend it. And um, like, like I said, great read. So Jerry, it, 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 and, and thank you for being so open with us yeah. and with our audience. And in your book, you, you talk about... I might uh, not be. You never know. <laughs> well, hopefully you will be. <laughs> but uh, I know you well enough to, be, uh, to, to know that you're always genuine, uh, whether it hurts or not, physically or emotionally. Does that make me blush, man. <laughs> so it, in your book, you talk about your, your father's abuse, both emotional, physical... Uh, the abuse wasn't an isolated event, but rather a pattern of behavior. Yet you're very different to your children, and we were just talking about this before the show start, uh, than your father was to you and, and your family. Mm -hmm. um, how did you manage to do that? Well, you know, it's a great, uh, a, a great question and uh, a great segue into, uh, you know, Jerry Coon's book. And, you know, I grew up, uh, learning things like you're no good, you're a failure, you're not going to amount to anything. Survival mechanisms that my father was taught in his household. And uh, fortunately for me, um, my father, well, I shouldn't say fortunately, but he drank a lot. And uh, he was very ab abusive. I'm, you know, I've heard so many stories of other people going through the same kind of stuff. And uh, so, I mean, you know, I mean, I... I, it was not easy. I, we all had our own hiding places in the house. And, wow. um, and mine was in the basement. And when you hear the chair move upstairs in the dining room, you wondered if he was going to come and come see you, right? Okay. And uh, so I grew up with that as a young kid. Uh, you know, I, I, my father drank a lot. I swore I was never going to drink. At 12, I had a bottle of Boone's Farm apple wine. Uh, 99 cents, of course, back in those long... I don't right. even know if they make that anymore. Sure. And I drank it down, and um, the next morning, I got home somehow. I crawled around on my knees at this party, drunk. I got home, and I woke up in the morning. I forgot all about that, how sick I got. I, I, I remembered the 15 minutes when I felt the big hole went away, mm -hmm. and I fit in, I was attractive, I was funny. The girls liked me, and... I thought to myself at 12, where has this been all my life? And, uh, and I became good at it. And unfortunately, you know, years to come later, I was to fight Larry Holmes for the heavyweight championship of the world. And afterwards, we became good friends. And I found out he never drank, never smoked, never took a drug his whole career. Holmes. And, and me, to get out of the pain, I learned how to get out of the pain. The confusion, the fear, the loneliness, the you know, regret, the, whatever it was. I didn't have the answers that I needed. I didn't get those answers. And the pain was so severe that, you know, uh, obviously, you know, drinking was a good friend of mine. And later I was to find out, I got into recovery, and um, I found out, you know, that it was a sad story with, that I went through. And I did not want to pass that on. And so I came into recovery and put the booze down and uh, started to understand what happened to me. And, and, uh, you know, it's like the story is like, you know, w you know, a buddy told me that we're animals are attracted to a certain scent, right? And people are, are attracted to a certain comfortability. So I feel I would meet these beautiful girls. They dress good or people. And, 
and uh, and I felt I could figure it out. I could help them, and it would be good. But it was never really. Uh, it was like this constant uh, fall down, get up, fall down, get up, and it was miserable. And it wasn't until I put the booze down that I was able to stand up and find out what I really liked, who I was, what I wanted to be. And you know, fortunately for me, with all that being said. Um, I became a fighter at 16, and uh, I never liked to fight. Um, but what happened to me was, it seemed like when I was 16, after every fight, I would go to the newspaper stand, and they put my picture on the back page of the Daily News. And so it made me somebody. Yeah. And boxing helped me to get rid of the anger, and then they put my picture on the paper. So that's how I became a fighter. Where most of my friends went to college, I wasn't going to college. I had to find a life. I left the home when I was 17. The, the last time I uh, talked to my father, I'd come home and drive him to the hospital for chemo. And when I was 17, he called me into the living room and said, if I can't live in, in his house under his rules, get my hair cut, get home when he wants me to get home. He told me I'd rather crawl to the hospital on my hands and knees. At 17, my old man told me that. That's how sad that story was. Wow. And that's all he could give me. So you, you actually trained with him. But oh, he, he built a, a ring in the backyard. He used to meet me in Queens at the Queens gym. Right. <clears throat> where I used to box with Vito Winter from with a middleweight gym. Yeah. And he would box me. Yeah. And you know, I could never hit him back. I, so much I, I often wanted to just, I, you know, I could have kicked his ass, right? right? But you held back. But I didn't right. for fear or whatever it was. And I found out later, I always wanted to, I wish I would have just kicked his ass. <laughs> and then I, I, I ran into somebody who did, and they really regretted it. So I was kind of glad that didn't happen. I didn't have that process. And I got away. And fortunately for me, I turned pro. And I got with some other people to help me see life differently. But let me tell you something. I have the greatest life in the world. I, I figured out those, those confusing times, the mix-ups, the mistakes I made, the losses I had. And you know, we have a tendency to fight on. Right. And you know, I had to pick myself up, dust off my pants, and move on. Not once, a few times. And you know, I, I picked wrong people, I made mistakes, but I cleaned it up. What did you feel like when your father passed away? Or, or did you feel, um, I won't say joy, but did you feel you were released? Did you feel angry? No, I took, this is a process. I mean, this is, life is a process. And you get the echoes of that in your head all your life, really. And, and so I made peace with it. I went to saw my, I see my father at, the, at the, where he was buried, and I spent an hour with him, two hours with him, and talked to him and tried to make peace with it. And, you know, I made peace for whatever he felt I did wrong. And it helped me to turn the page a little bit and to start moving forward and to change those attractions of dysfunction that I grew up with him and when you do that you have a tendency of meeting the same people like you know I, I hung around people who struggled there was struggling going on in their home you mentioned before that you thought you didn't deserve anything but now but once you went you turned pro and you saw your, your picture on the paper uh, and you were succeeding that that kind of turned your life around well, you know, I wouldn't say it turned my life around. It gave me a direction. It helped me to express the anger I was feeling for what happened to me. And then I started to make money. And I, I made it to the finals of the Olympic trials right. in 1976. And I told them, I'm sorry, I can't make it. I came back from Europe. I had four knockouts. Uh, I, 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 the Russian team came to town. I knocked the Russian out, the third-ranked Russian, in, in the one round. And I got the phone call to go to the finals of the trial. I said, I can't do it. My father's sick. I got to stay close to my family. Okay, now that was 10% true. But 90% was, I don't have the confidence. What am I going to go make an ass of myself? And I never showed up on the, one of the most biggest days of my life. And maybe I couldn't have made it, but I could have grown from that opportunity. And that's what part of my story is, is to, to fight on and to jump in the water. You know, take the risk. And, uh, and then I'll tell you one of the... One of the terrible stories in my life was on May 11th, 1981, I'm ranked one in the world. And I'm fighting Kenny Norton in the garden. Mm -hmm. And I was, I believe that night I probably could have beat Holmes. I was in such great shape. I was fighting Mandingo, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and you, that was one of the most brutal knockouts in, yeah, in and the history of the game. 
you know, for me, I was like, I had to touch you, let you know what I had. And I hit him with the right hand, he buckled a little bit. So when you're a professional fighter, you say, well, let me take 30 seconds to give this guy a shot. So I went on him, spun him into the corner, 54 seconds into that fight. It was all over. And uh, you think I would have said, well, I'm going to fight Holmes. I better get a good trainer, a good nutritionist, a good condition coach. No, but I started drinking that night. Really? And around and, right after the... the and you know, 13 fight. months later, I fought Holmes. Yeah. And I got stopped in the 13... Almost like I self-sabotaged myself. Listening to those voices growing up in my house, I kind of set that up. And I felt like I started drinking because if I couldn't beat Holmes, it wasn't me, it was the booze. Mm -hmm. It's just crazy how the mind works. So it was more mental... Oh, did you see that, bro? (laughs) So it was more mental than it was physical. In other words... You're just explaining that you walked into the ring after an amazing fight with Ken Norton where you were in shape and you were mentally prepared for it and you walked into the ring with, with uh, Holmes, Holmes, you know, not in the best shape of your life, no. but more importantly, not mentally in, in, in the best right. uh, And we place. justify what we're doing. We justify and figure, well, I can handle it. Mm-hmm. It's not gonna, I can get through this, but you can't. If you don't change the oil in your car, the transmission is going to break down. And so, I, as a young kid, I just, uh, it was very scary. I went from hiding in the basement to everybody loved Jerry Cooney. It was like, how do you cope with that? How do you trust it? Right. I learned not to trust. Right. And so, drinking helped me hide behind that. And drinking was the vehicle that helped me to get to that place. And uh, it was a lot of mistakes. So my story is, uh, you know, is of triumph. I, I, I succeeded. I got through the fight. I got stopped in the 13th round. We had a great fight. Um, I made a lot of money. And my story is to, to help the people coming forward to not fall in that hole. You know, my story was I got up, I got dressed, I walked down the street, I fell in the hole. Dusted off my pants, went about my day. The next day I got up, I got dressed, I fell, walked down the street, fell in the hole. And the third day I broke my leg. So I had to find a different way to go. Right. And that's the story about life. And hopefully we don't catch that too late. And we can make that change. And, you know, uh, I was attracting the same sickness of the people that were around me. So we were just doing the best we could. There's the Jerry Cooney that knocked out uh, Norton still exist? Oh, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm a fighter. I mean, you know, yeah. I, yeah. I teach it now. It's the greatest yeah. feeling in the world to teach, to give kids hope. I was with a kid at a at-risk home, and, you know, he's scared about life. 15, going to be 16. What am I going to do? I'm able to, you know, I was teaching him a light bag, and he kind of cowered away from me because I was telling him how to do it the right way, and he got offended, and I said, I'm a teacher. I'm going to teach you to... to uh, do it correctly, and then five minutes later, he's doing a good job. Mm-hmm. And that's what our job is for me, is to teach, instill that confidence, and hopefully that kid will be able to turn the page and have a better life today. So, un- unlike your father's voice, which was more from what I could take from you, was more abusive, more threatening, uh, you're more of a mentor, and uh, a positive influence well, yeah, in these younger people. Right, Manny. And so sometimes what, not only am I giving it to that kid, but I'm also healing that little kid in me, if you can so, so to speak in some ways, that that was what I needed. I needed someone to grab me by the arm when I knocked out Norton and say, come on, come with me, it's important now, let's pay attention. I didn't have that, I didn't, didn't trust. That. But anyway, it, you know, it's uh, it's been a great life. I've traveled the world, I've met, I've been to parties where uh, everybody from Frank Sinatra to Kareem wow. Abdul-Jabbar Maj- was at the party. Right. And with Holmes and I, and I've done so many great things. I've been to Africa, Central America. I've been all over the world. And uh, I get to promote this new guy that is about love and hope and charity and freedom. And that's a beautiful thing. How were you able to... Well... How long were you uh, using, uh, abusing uh, substances? Well, I mean, I was drinking since I started drinking at 12. 12, right. And I put it down in 31. Okay. So, uh, you know, it was, a, it was 20 years or yeah, so, right? Yeah, yeah. And, 
And so it, it's a process to get my, my, my life back in line mm -hmm. and, and uh, to free myself from all those negativities and those setbacks and the mistakes I made and the uh, pain I went through and to become free of it. And, you know, obviously I was very blessed to meet the right guy to help me along the road. And, and I believe that's, a, that's a, a God in my life that finally, you know, God comes to me and wants to help me. If I'm not available, he goes. Right. And uh, I was ready. I, I surrendered and uh, and uh, got back on the road. And it's life has been fantastic. You know, I, amazing I, I, story. I, uh, you know, listen, I do. I go make appearances. I give everybody a hard time. And at the end, they say, thank you, Jerry. They pay me and they say, can you come back next year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah, got yeah. it better than me. Yeah, nobody. Nobody. Um, do you beat yourself up more than your opponents? Well, obviously, no. Um, obviously, uh, you know, you have a plan and you have another plan. And so when the bell rings, you are paying attention. And my job is to get him. And I want to feel, I want to see his pain. And you can kind of see it change in his face. When you catch him with a nice body shot, or you hit him on the chin, and uh, you know we, we find a way. This is what we do. This is why I'm right. here today because right. I'm finding a way right. to turn the page and not give that to him. I got great kids. I got three great kids that are beautiful, very successful, doing a lot of great things. And fortunately, I was able to meet my wife, <clears throat> and we together raised this beautiful family. Right. Well, congratulations on that. Yeah. And on your turnaround. Uh, in, in your book, Gentleman Jerry, you mentioned that you were always happiest 10 minutes after, uh, rather, five minutes after a fight, but then after 10 minutes... Go back minutes, in the hole again, right? Yeah, you go back and the demons would come back. What, so, what, what did that mean? I had this good friend of mine, you know, and he told me, Jerry, when you knock out this guy, Ron Lyle, in the Coliseum, he said, I want you to reach out and touch those people. I get chills when I tell you that now. Because I thought when he said it to me, I was like, what are you talking about? But in the moment when I knocked him through the ropes and he got knocked cold, I could feel the people. And I became alive, like I could take it in, right? But then I had to, when that was over, I had to go back to the, the guy that has to work hard again. And I'll tell you a quick story. I was in Boston. We were on a press tour for the Holmes fight. And Boston Gardens is a big Irish sure, of course. Uh, community. And I went into the old Boston Gardens, and the whole place st stood up and roared me for 10 minutes. And it felt so good, right? And then 10 minutes later, I walked out the door, and my first impression was, ah, they don't mean that. Because that's, really? unfortunately, that's what our brains do to survive. We have to pick ourselves up and, and try and make it through. And, and um, today, I'm no longer that way. I enjoy them. I say things like, thank you, or... You know, you'd pay me a compliment. I'd spend 10 minutes talking you out of it. Today, I say thank you. You know, uh, uh -huh. that's the story. You know, and I, and I, uh, I do good things. I believe in myself. I, very helpful to, to people, and uh, I love myself today. That was something I could never get to. When you told me you love me, I gotta go. I, I couldn't figure right. that out. Right. Today, it's uh, from the path I took and the help I've got along the road. I have a great life, man. It's like wow. God bless. I'm, I'm happy for you and yeah. your loved ones and your fans. Whoa! You missed that one, bro. You're still <laughs> shaking a little bit. Right? <laughs> so anyway, I love the book. Yeah, sure. You know, I never like to read anything or see any interviews I do. Mm -hmm. I never... Uh, I've had so many interviews at home in my cabinet. I never, ever listen to myself. I'm on the radio, Sirius XM, twice a week, uh, um, Channel 156. Uh, 12 to 2 every Monday, every Friday. I never listened to myself. Um, this book I had to read because the, the, the guy I did the book with was kind of like a little, you know, soft and I had a hard life. Yeah. And so I had to reread it and clean it up a little bit, right? Sure. And so, and when I finished reading the book, I was free. I was like, wow, I have been had such a great life. I've touched all the greatest things, sure. all the, the things I wanted to do, and it's in this book. And it started out terrible, but I got a great family today that I love, and I learned to become intimate with my friendships, with my wife, my family, things I never would have possibly had. 
Right. You know, that... Uh, that you have. You know, I tell everybody... And you like, deserve. In my life, I make all the big decisions in my, with my wife. And she makes all the small decisions, right? Mm -hmm. And in the last 30 years, there's not been any big decisions. So she makes all the decisions. Okay. And it's it all frees cool. you up to do all the other things that you you're know doing. What, uh, you know, it, it's magical. Yeah. And and, uh, and when uh, you were when you were a child, what did you want to be? What did you think you were going to be? What what did you have any dreams or ambitions of being something when you were a little kid? Well, you know, that's, that's another great question. Is I learned to sit in the back of the room, don't raise my hand, out of sight, out of mind. No one's going to bother me, right? Because that's where I grew up in. And uh, I had this older brother, Tom. I have this older brother, Tom. and He left the house when he was 15. And he made it to a gym when he was 18. And I used to go to that gym, watch him a couple of days a week. And uh, one day, I always had a heavy bag in the basement. I went and I asked if I could box somebody. They put me in with this little Italian guy who knocked me around the gym. And I threw the gloves off and went home. I said, forget this is not for me. But the next day, I went down in the basement and I put the gloves on, and I understood the guy was going to come at me, so I had to learn to breathe. Two days later, I went back to that gym. I asked if I could box that kid again at 15 and a half, and he couldn't do that to me. And then six months later, I went into the New York State Golden Glove Championships and won the middleweight title. Wow. And, uh, and I remember Herman Sporting Goods Store, I don't think they're around now, said, if you win the title... We'll give you a free heavy bag. And that next morning, <laughs> I was at Herman's Sporting Goods still getting my heavy bag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At yeah. 16. Yeah, that's great. And I was 6'4", 160 pounds. I had to lose yeah, 8 yeah. pounds before the fight, and the night before the fight. And uh, so it fed me. You know, and I found that later on that boxing helped me to express my anger. Mm -hmm. And they put my picture in the paper, so it made me somebody. And that's all I ever wanted. Okay. And then they had to follow, had to follow that dream. And... Uh, my friends were going to college. I wasn't going to college. So I, uh, I didn't go to the finals of the Olympic trials. But then I started to look for management. And there was a management team who had Howard Davis, who was a gold medal winner in 1976, great fighter. And uh, his mother passed away during the Olympics. And oh. she wanted him to stay. So he stayed, won the best fighter of the year. Uh, and uh, Wow. So I figured that I was going to go with his people because I'd be able to be showcased with him wherever he traveled. And that's what happened to me. And, uh, and I took it as far as I could go. Well, don't shortchange yourself. I mean, you've had a tremendous record yourself. You, you fought in, uh, in Britain and Wales and oh, no. a lot of parts in Europe. And but by you no had means. a tremendous record. And Ring Magazine has you uh, as number 53. Hardest hitter ever uh, in the history of boxing, which is incredulous given knowing how many, I don't know, tens of thousands of professional boxers that has been in, in, uh, in the history of boxing. And to be in that top hundred, uh, I know I'd feel good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, I think of Whitney Houston, that moment in time. I've had that moment in time, but I'm still not, I still got more moments in time. That I'm that I'm working through right now. That I'm I'm growing and I'm helping kids, helping people, and and uh, hopefully, you know, change the course of some kids' lives. When you worked in Foley Square as a construction worker, uh, did you think that you would be doing that indefinitely, or was fighting a way out of that? Listen, it was a great job. I was uh, local 40, great guys, right. uh, and my father got me in there. And was I thinking that, well, you know what? I was up on the, the first day on the job, I was on the 38th floor, and they told me, get out and hold the wrench on the corner of the building. And I was like, what? <laughs> but they had me walking on two-inch beams by the time I got out of it and um, worked for them for a year and a half or two years or so, and then my career took over and I wanted to see how far I could go. And so every opportunity I had, I took the fight and moved forward and moved forward. And, uh, you know, I think about my son is 25 now, a great kid. Uh, he's an engineer. He graduated from Lehigh. When I was 25, I was fighting Larry Holmes for the heavyweight championship of the world. It's hard to believe. Unbelievable. And not only that, that was during the time of the great fighters. Yeah. Uh, well, he was a great fighter. Larry Holmes. Oh, absolutely. And, and you had a heck of a fight and a lot of expectations 
uh, were weighing heavy on you. Um, a lot of people, I'm sure, were expecting things of you, uh, not only because where you came from, but from your background. And there were, uh, how did that affect mentally uh, you going into that I'll fight? Tell you a quick story. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> you're in your dressing room, right? And you're hanging out and you're, you're getting warmed up and you hear a knock on the door. And the door opens up and the guy says, Cooney, you're next. And the first thing you think to yourself is, oh, shit. <laughs> and then you take that long walk from that corridor out to where the arena is, and you hear the roar of the crowd, and then you become magical. And then you become magical when the bell rings, you got this plan, and you make the adjustments. You listen to your corner, and you find out, you know, what to do next. And I've had that experience so many times. As a matter of fact, I had it every day. I would think about this, I'd be going into the gym where I was training and there'd be five sparring partners. Mm -hmm. And while I was boxing with one of them, the other four were watching me, trying to find out how to get me. Yeah. So yeah. I had to stay ahead of them. Yeah. And uh, those are all greatest moments. Sure. You know, I, I see some of those guys sometimes. I remember those moments. I watch a film. I, you know, I talk to them uh, and I write a book. And yeah. uh, I've come meet with you. And you fought, again, during the golden era of boxing. Yeah. You know, Sugar Ray Leonard, Larry Holmes, uh, all these. I see all those guys. old guys now. And it was, it, but it was, it was before MMA, before cage yeah. fighting, before all that. I mean, being a heavyweight boxer, a heavyweight contender, yeah. it was it, man. That was, yeah. that was it. You know, you're 100% right. If heavyweight division was strong, boxing was strong. Right. Today, right. you have lightweights, welterweights, middleweights, light heavyweights that are so great. So boxing's right. kind of picked itself up, and it, we're doing great. But uh, And the only reason why I know that because I'm on the, a Sirius XM, and I follow the game, and I know all the fighters. And uh, um, So, yeah, I, I had a magical life. I having a magical you're, you're, life. It continues. And uh, let, me, let me ask you about your... Not right now, not right now. Okay. Not right now. <laughs> Also, <laughs> Let, let's let's talk a minute about your sobriety. How did you get there? How do you maintain it? And as importantly, if not more importantly, please tell us about your work with other people that have addiction problems and how do you get them to get sober and how do you mentor them to have a better life like you discovered? Well, you know, you have to want it. You can think it and, and watch people, but, you know, um, there came a day where I remember I was in this beautiful home in East Hampton where I lived, and I woke up at 20 minutes to 11 by myself in this beautiful home, hungover, thinking to myself, what happened? You know, I disappeared from the fight game. I um, uh, got away, and and then I said, "That's it. I, I, I quit." So I put it down. Just like that. Next day, I woke up at 20 minutes to 11 again, hungover. Mm -hmm. And it was the day I said, "God, please, you got to help me now. I need your help." And the desire to drink went away, and um, I. Uh, it's just amazing. The story is that. I turned on the television and George Benedict from the Seafield Center was on. It happened to be Alcohol Awareness Week in the Hamptons. Wow. And I remembered that number and I called him. He met me at a meeting. And uh, he gave me the hope I needed. And I put it down and I started going to meetings every day. It wasn't the last time I drank. So two months into that, someone told me, you better be careful, you're going to drink again. I said, are you out of your mind? I'm going to meetings every day. I'm doing all the things. And it was almost five uh, a couple more months I picked up again for two months and it was the best thing that happened for me because I realized I was that one little grain of sand and that I needed help I needed someone to teach me about alcoholism and how powerful it is as a disease it's not like a choice and um, and I remember this friend of mine who used to run a strip joint used to collect money he was a, a bodyguard of mine and I was going to my office, and I pulled off the highway into Pancake House. 
He was sitting there in the front seat, and he said, Jerry, sit down with me. Today I'm celebrating three years clean, sober. Uh -huh. And he said, you never have to drink again. And I thought, that doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. And that was the last time I had a drink. Hmm. And uh, I started to go to meetings. I met people. I learned how to uh, work through the program and to, uh, to have hope and to put time between me and the booze and then help other people. And in helping other people, I was helping myself. Right. Gave me strength and courage. And, um, and then, you know, for me, it's like sometimes I get off a phone call with a conversation with somebody. And I think, where did that come from? That wasn't for me. And I think that was the higher power of my life that was able to give me that when they say when there's one or more people together, you have this uh, knowledge. And, and so that's been my experience. And listen, we all want to uh, help the next guy. We all want to, you know, as, as, as celebrity athletes, we always help the less fortunate out. We always show up at, at benefits to help the, raise money so those people can have a little freedom. Thank God for all the good work that you do. Thank God for um, everything you've done. Now, personal question, because I've, I've been a big fan of yours forever. Uh, you've gotten hit in a, a lot of times in your uh, multiple. I can't degree. remember. I can't remember. <laughs> Who <laughs> hit you the hardest? My wife. <laughs> That's awesome. Listen, I think you hit a lot of times. I got hit. And that came right out, too. Listen, That's good. Great That's good. Great fights, great experiences. And when you're a professional fighter, yeah. your body secretes endorphins, yeah. right? Yeah. And so you don't, it's like a numbing feeling. Right. You don't feel it. Right. And uh, I would have to say the best fighter I ever fought was Larry Holmes, the greatest fighter. You know, we, we on my radio show, uh, uh, we did a, a breakdown of all the heavyweights through history. Uh, of Jack Johnson up to Marciano and from Marciano to, you know, today's time. Sure. And uh, Larry Holmes came out. Ali was number one, and Lennox Lewis and Larry Holmes came in second. So he was the smartest guy. Yeah. He was patient. He waited. He yeah. found the openings. Terrific he jab. Tied you out yeah. and made yeah. you, you know, op vulnerable, right? Yeah. And the strongest guy hit was Foreman. Though Foreman would tell you. Uh, if you listen to, go on YouTube and listen to him on David Letterman, he said every fighter runs into three punchers in their career. Jerry Cooney, <laughs> uh, two other guys, and David Letterman says, Cooney was the most powerful guy. Yeah, he was the most powerful guy. More powerful than Frazier, but Foreman was a tremendous puncher. Yeah. And yeah, Cooney yeah. was an uppercut. Yeah. And, uh, but anyway. It, it's funny because Mike Tyson, when he knocked out uh, Holmes, he was asked the same thing right after the fight. And Holmes' response, you may recall, was like, nah, nah, guys like uh, Ernie Banks and these guys, they hit much harder than Tyson. Tyson has, he hits sharper, but these other guys. Well, you know, that's harder. the story is that, you know, um, Tyson got uh, Holmes, King put him in there to, right. to just get a fight. Right, right. And, and so it was a bad time. Holmes should have never taken that fight. And uh, listen, there was a time when Mike Tyson said, I'm the maddest man on this planet. And you believed him. He was. And then we were to find out that back in the Olympic days, he used to box to Holyfield. Holyfield always had his number. Did losing to Larry Holmes cause a downward spiral for your uh, substance abuse? Of course. You know, because in some ways you feel like that failure that... I was always told growing up, mm -hmm. you know, and that as much as I was using alcohol, so in if I did lose, I could use that as an excuse. There was no excuses. Mm -hmm. So that was the beginning of the end for me. You know, then I went through some family situations with the substance abuse and trying to fix them and get them better. And obviously I realized at that point that I had to pick myself up and turn the page and get on my life, and so did they. And so that's how that happened for me. And. Uh, it was a great experience, painful experience, painful. Painful, but you picked yourself up, you dusted yourself off, and you got sober, and now you're I helping I other a little late, sober people. But I grew up. At the end of the day, uh, you know, you, you can't beat yourself up that hard because you had a tough, tough childhood. I mean, well, what happens to us growing up in a very dysfunctional family is that's the first thing you go to. You have to really work hard at 
you know, we stare at that. Like they, there's a saying in the, in the rooms that look in the rear view mirror, but don't stare. Right. So it's there, but then you learn things to make it go away. And you know, it's not true and it's right. not real. And right. what was given to me was a survival mechanism. But this is about living life and not survival mechanism. And, and, uh, and that's the joy. Because you see it grow in other people, like I said, at risk home for kids. I, I'm with them all the time. And they, I show them a highlight film of my fights, and they all identify with the fight of life. Sure. And so, you know, you, get, you, you get the ear. And you, you both, get the ear. You, you've also visited prisons, right? Oh, yeah. And you've done work there. Well, yeah, you. well, why not? I mean, that's another... Sure. another uh, most people end up in prison through substance abuse, alcohol. And uh, some people want, want three square meals in a bed. Right. But uh, a lot of people, you know, they, they make those mistakes. And so we need to change that. We need to, to turn that page and, you know, move along a little more quickly. You can, you know, I tell people all the time, you can get sober in one year or you can get sober in 20 years. You know, what do you want? You want 20% of life or you want 100% of that life? Right. Like there's no more do-overs. There's no more practices. This is the big one. Now, you, you have a, a, a plan. You want the plan or you want to... If you're not ready for the plan, i got to go. Right. If I can help you, I'm going to help you. Right. But if not, when you get ready, you come back and see me. Right. If not, you have other people that need well, and want your help. You know, yeah. So I'm saying that, you know, it's... 30% uh, of life is no good for me. Right. You know, I... You want I, uh, 110%, yeah, I wanna, ideally. I want to live. I want to feel. I want to be intimate with my wife which I've been so blessed to have. I can't wait to go to bed with my wife tonight. And I feel that way every night. Amazing. It's That's a beautiful great. thing. That's great. And um, so, so you were a champion in the ring, I don't a want boxing to champion. I don't want to but you're also a champion of sobriety. Life. Life is. Uh, which listen. one do you prefer? Um, if there is a preference. Listen, here's a story for me, right? I still get to play Jerry Cooney. I still was on Wall Street last week raising money for less fortunate kids. I got to teach kids boxing. I got to rub elbows with all the celebrities, and there was a lot of them there. I get to uh, do charity work and, and play Jerry Cooney. I get to do those things, and I get to come home and be Jerry, the other Jerry Cooney. So I'm so fortunate. I have the both, best of both sides. I'm reminded of my past. Listen, I fought Holmes 40 years ago. Wow, it's 40 years ago, long. we're the best of friends. Yeah. We talk to each other once a week. We hang out. We make appearances together. And, and I went, just came back from Europe. With him. I was in Europe for the 40th anniversary of our, of our fight. Well, I'll tell you what. How about this? How about you and Larry come here and do a, a show with he us? He don't want me no more, bro. He's way too old. He don't want me no more. <laughs> he can't take it. He can't. Sure, I mean, listen, we... We do everything together. I think that I think that'd be fun and interesting, and, and people would like to see that. You know, have you discuss both? You know, now that you're you're, you're fast true friends, have you discuss you know the build up to the fight, the fight itself, and how you became friends and the good work more as importantly, if not more importantly, the good work that you do now for others as a team individually and. Uh, We'll, we'll, we'll try to put that one together. I, I think, you know, that, that Larry made peace with, with his career. He was a great fighter. Yeah. Like I said, number two in history. And uh, he, unfortunately for him, he followed Ali. He was in Ali's camp. He was in Frazier's camp. And it's a hard act to follow in Ali's camp. Absolutely. And so I think he was kind of felt sad fighting Ali, but also he got rid of some of that anger that uh, he was in Ali's, you know. Sure. Yeah, and so, um, but today, he's a good dude, man. He's a, he's a great man. He helps people all the time. Uh, he doesn't throw the jab so fast anymore, but <laughs> but he still throws a good jab. And yeah, we'd love to come on with you guys. That'd be great. Well, um, I think that we got a good look at Jerry Cooney's other life besides the obvious, the great boxing, the great heavyweight. Uh, Wait a second. <laughs> what the same, right? Look there the you same. go. There you go. There you go. What do you, what do you guys think? What do you guys think? Email us. <laughs> I feel like I feel like Ismus. You know what that is? Ismus be my lucky day. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you, Jerry, for coming Great on. Great to be with you, uh, Always a pleasure to see you, to talk to you, to, yeah. to catch up. And thank you so much for letting us talk about your past. And I know it's painful. I know it hurts. Uh, you totally. lost your father at, totally. at a young age. I did as well. Uh, my father also had issues that I had to deal with and overcome. And uh, still working on it. Like right. you, I'm still a work in progress. Right. We all are. We all should be. And I respect and appreciate that from you. So thank you. And uh, I'm sure I'll see you soon. But we'll also see you hopefully back with... Uh, the Eastern Assassin, great. Jerry Holmes. Great. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Jerry Cooney, thank you. Sit down. When he looks, I fall in. See yeah. that? Yeah. So I sit down. It's in my mouth. I bring my body in. Yeah. Then I sit down again. I turn it over. Right. So this thing was the shit, right, bro? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so watch. Hands down. This is you. See me? Yeah. See my face? Right. This is you. Mm -hmm. This is me. See the difference? Yeah. So if I do this to you, what are you going to do to me? Come back. Well, what about that one? With the right okay. Too, yeah. So what, when I do this, what can you do to me? Nothing. Nothing right here. All right. So get your head out of the way, cause it don't feel good. Let me see you right here. Again. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that hurt.